We'll get a red hymnal, turn to hymn number 50. Hymn number 50 in the red hymnal. Let's all stand and join in singing, Bear us, Lord Jesus, the ruler of all nature. nature. secrets about stuff and, and by and large it's probably a good thing um, and so you know and definitely the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time were kind of letting down the nation of Israel because you know they had, they had a lot of problems Jesus um, wasn't shy about pointing out those problems either and so uh, it, it uh they saw somebody that was different than everybody else they ever heard, and they said, well, uh, and they, they looked at what Jesus did. Uh, he was helping people that nobody else would even help. Um, do you realize what a thing leprosy was back in the old days? I mean, they used to put you on an island 
or lock you up behind walls like a prison. And if you did go roaming around the public, you had to identify yourself. Um, modern people wouldn't put up with it. They really wouldn't. There would, there would be a, a group of liberal politicians, you know, friends of the leper or something, you know. <laughs> they, would, they, they would try to pass legislation in Congress to, uh, you know, destigmatize lepers. Well, no, you didn't do that because if you did, people would start dying of leprosy everywhere because they'd get leprosy. Uh, so you see how stupid some of the stuff we put up with is in our day and age. Uh, if the disciples were around, they would just shake their head and, uh, and probably walk away uh, from this society. Uh, but they were looking for someone too. In Mark, Mark chapter 4, we'll look there, Mark chapter 4. Gospel of Mark's a real unusual book. It's it's the it's the shortest of the gospels. Um, yet it's probably the most complete chronicle we have of everything Jesus said, or not so much said, but did. Uh, it records some stuff the others don't. Uh, there's a couple places in Luke like that, um, and I, I I think of my favorite gospels. Uh, Luke Luke and, and Mark are, are probably my favorites. Uh, of course, I've preached so much out of John. Uh, let's face it, uh, when, you, when you love the Bible, all of it kind of gets to be a precious thing. Um, Mark chapter 4, verse 38. Verse 38. Turn page it says, And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him, saying unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Well, just by his response, Jesus did care, didn't he? Amen. And I felt them disciples kind of felt real bad after the boat calmed down and they probably looked at the angel like, Oh, we done messed up. He's going to be mad at us. But you know he wasn't. He just took it in stride. Because, you know, they here, here, there's not a whole lot sailor people are afraid of. Uh, a hole in a boat, they don't particularly care for. Uh, but a real bad storm that overcomes your ship, that they're a little scared of. Because even with modern ships that we have with all kinds of devices and radar and sonar and uh, LIDAR and everything else we got, um, there's still occasionally we have problems with uh, ships, even big ships, floundering and stuff. Um, and we have some of the most advanced ships in the world, our Navy does. We really do. You look at them and they, and I, I look at pictures of them online and I say, that's a weird looking ship, because it is. Because I'm used to seeing all those uh, battleships and movies, you know, and they're, they're covered in guns and stuff. Well, that's not how a new ship looks. There's, uh, you know, they've got all kinds of stuff undercover that's secret, I guess, or some, some kind of special missile launchers or something. But you don't, know, you don't want to mess with our Navy. But still, I imagine when it gets to be high seas on the Atlantic or in the Pacific in some places, uh, you know, everybody's kind of you know, holding on for dear life because that's one thing sailors are afraid of. So, in in a time of a storm, even these disciples were looking at Jesus and they wanted confirmation that he cared. Now, this shows that they believed that he could do something for them. That's a great thing. And it also shows they weren't afraid to uh, wake him up and get him to do it. Um, sometimes when we pray, it takes a while for God to answer prayer. It does. It's aggravating. Uh, I preached on that uh, Wednesday night um, that, you know, we have to wait on God to fix stuff. Right. Sometimes God has to wait on us to do things. Um, Jesus sleeping in the boat, I, you know, it's, it's, you study the humanity of Christ uh, and we find the Bible says he was fashioned as a man. So he wasn't exactly the same as sinful people because he didn't have a sinful nature in him. Uh, he had the capacity to sin if he wanted to, 
but he chose not to. And that's different from every person you've ever met. So Jesus was a uh, strange person, but they, they knew he cared. And you've got to know Jesus cares for you this morning. And you need him, you need to go to him in prayer. You say, what if he makes me wait too late? God never makes you wait too late. God's on time every time. It's us who worry about the clock. God didn't invent this. Sort of he did, but th this keeps track of what God invented. This particular thing is a man's invention. Um, I don't know what went through the mind of the first clockmaker. Uh, if I think if he knew what clocks were going to be used for and how they were going to be used in the future, I think he probably would have took a hammer or what, what he had built. I would have, but uh, that's just me. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Verse 40. Luke chapter 10, verse 40. What does the song say? Time is now fleeting. The moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Yeah, they have a tendency to do that. Luke 10, 40. But Martha was comforted about with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. All right. Here's Martha and Mary. My, two of my favorite characters, three characters, Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus. And, you know, they're, they're kind of like the, uh, the, the Bobsy trio of the, the New Testament. They're always saying stuff that uh, I'm sure they regretted later. And here Martha, you know, good old Martha. Uh, Martha was the kind of person that if something was a little off, she would let you know. If you were in charge of whatever party or gathering or business, you know, she, brother, if you had her employee, she'd be calling you every other day telling you what was wrong, what, you, what was going on in your company. I mean, that's just the kind of person she was. And, and you know, she just didn't come and say, look, make my sister go do this. She, she had to bring it. Don't you care, Lord? Well, of course Jesus cared. But there was something else going on that Martha was, you know, I don't Straight over at you, she was oblivious of it. So uh, I want you to see here that um, the disciples, all, all of them that followed Jesus, they were looking for somebody that cared. And in every case, when it comes up, Jesus shows that he cared. Even in the answer to Martha, which is, is a, I preach on this lots of times. Uh, I, I mean, even though he didn't go to Mary and say, you better go have your sister. She's, She's about to, you know, throw a clutch plate. Uh, he didn't do that. He just explained what was going on and let Martha sort it out. Um, I think later on, Martha finally got it sorted out. It took her a while. And some people are like that. Um, sometimes I wonder if I'm not like that. You know, sometimes I just, uh, I don't get it at first sometimes. Um, so, I want you to see that even the disciples were looking uh, for some someone to care. Now, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, Luke chapter 10, just across the page, is what I wanted to get us there for. Luke chapter uh, 10, verse 29. And he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, um, in the previous uh, two verses, verse 25, it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, this is a very Old Testament situation here. You don't have to do anything to inherit eternal life. You have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's enough. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to join a church or get baptized or take communion or uh, skip down the highway in a certain, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or go uh, go pass out tracts or, or, or something, you know, baptistic, you know. Uh, you don't have to do any of that stuff to get to heaven. Now, it's a great thing if you do, but that's not a requirement. And this guy, being an Old Testament uh, kind of a person, uh, Jesus is coming and preaching stuff that he's never heard because he's taken 
stuff out of the Old Testament that's there, but no one at the time was pointing it out except Jesus. And that's the one of thinking about these stories. So he wanted to justify himself. Now we have a we have a word for this. And this is something you don't want to get involved in, but I have met many Christians. Oh yeah, they get involved in it. something that displeased God and, and that, that was the only rule they had. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of a, a bad thing. So this guy comes up and he says, look, what, what, what do I have to do to get eternal life? To, to inherit eternal life. Now, Brother Vic, explain to me why this word inherit is important in this verse here. What's an inheritance? Inheritance is something you gain from somebody else. Uh huh. But it's something that you feel is your right. See, in the Old Testament, the oldest son inherited what his father had. So when the father died, he, he was obligated by tradition to give what he had to his eldest son. Now, sometimes he would give a big, the majority of it to the son, and then he would leave little. Uh, different things to the rest of the family. So this guy, he's coming and he feels like he's entitled to something. That is the basic fallacy of this word here, self-righteousness, because somebody is trying to be so right they want to impress God. Well, tell me something. What would you do if I gave everybody a piece of paper and say, write down how would you impress God? What would you say? I know what I would say. I would say, meet my friend Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'd say, sure. Because I ain't got nothing to impress God. I mean, really. What have I got to impress God with? Not much. I, I look, I look like a sack of potatoes with legs on them. I mean, you know, 
uh, I'm not much. Um, and y'all could do far better for preachers probably. But here I am. So here's this guy, and he's entitled self-righteous. He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? So Jesus is real good about putting things right back on someone's uh, doorstep. And said, okay, what do you think? You come big, big feller here that, that wants, it's a, it, Mr. Entitled Man here that feels like God owes him something. Or what do you think? How, how read you the Old Testament? What, what is your interpretation, buddy? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Well, that's actually the correct Old Testament answer. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, do this, and thou shalt live. And pretty much that's the case in the Old Testament law period. If you follow these two verses to the letter, you would come out good when you got up to heaven. But 29 is the deal breaker here. And he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? See, that's this old self-righteousness rising up and saying, okay, I, I know that I'm not good enough and, and I will never tell nobody because I have to admit that I was a sinner and I did things that displeased God. So I'm going to find a loophole somewhere and he thought this was a loophole. Well, what's the definition of neighbor? Well, you know, that's a good question. And this parable of the Good Samaritan answers that question. I mean, if, if, if I said to you, who's your neighbor? Most Americans would think, okay, i got a house on that side of my house and another house, and I've got some people live across the street. They're my neighbors. And you might even stretch us out for the people that live on your street or maybe in your whole neighborhood. Uh, I guess if you're real generous, everybody lives in Coca-Cola can be your neighbor. But you wouldn't feel necessarily like people in the Mobile were your neighbor. Or Birmingham or Montgomery. Those people live in another town. But somebody from good old Pensacola, uh, yeah, they, 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 maybe you could consider them a neighbor. But this guy was looking for a loophole. He was, he was looking to, uh, uh, he was probably thinking, okay, I can be good to the people that live in the same vicinity as I am, but outside of that, you know, I don't know. I'm not that good. And Jesus knew all this to begin with. He knew all this. And so he starts telling this story. In verse 30, Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. What's wrong with that little sentence there? Not that God wrote anything wrong, but what is Jesus pointing out that's very markedly wrong with this fellow in the story? But that down yeah. He's going down. Now, if you look at the topography of the land of Israel, uh, whoop, and fall if I don't put down. All right, here, here you got like the Mediterranean Sea, okay, and then you got the shores of Israel and. Judah, they call it the Judean hill country. And then you kind of go, and then you hit the Jordan River, and then you have the plains of Gilead and Bashan. Well, Jerusalem sits on one of these hills, okay? Jericho was a coastal town on the river. River town. Now, United States people know a little bit about river towns. Um, <coughs> the Mississippi River is probably the most famous river in the United States. And there are, Hollywood loves the Mississippi River. Why? Well, in the old days, you had these floating gambling palaces that went up and down the river, these steamboats. That's what, and, what, and there's other probably stuff that went on in them that's unsavory. 
And all the little towns, Natchez, Mississippi, and the worst one of all is the one that's south of everything. What is that? Can anybody know what that town is? New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah, boy, New Orleans was a party town, boy. Woo! -hoo. Even it didn't have to be Mardi Gras. You went to New Orleans to have fun. And the further north you went on the river, the uh, the less fun things got because they didn't have any towns hardly at the beginning. But that's why Hollywood loves the Mississippi River because of all the unsavory things that went on. Well, guess what? Jericho was a bad town to begin with. God knocked down the walls one time, remember? Mm -hmm. So this guy wasn't going to Jerusalem, to the temple. He wasn't going to some, uh, you know, city... Uh, like Shiloh, uh, that had a connection with the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle at one point in the Old Testament. Um, you know, he wasn't going seeking the prophet in the hill country. Or he wasn't even going to hide out in one of the caves up there, the limestone caves. He was going down to have, have a party, man. That's where he was going. He was going the wrong way. Boy, I tell you what. I need a lot of people that go the wrong way nowadays. They think they're going the right way, um, but they're going the wrong way. And, and they don't realize that there's a, there's a cliff up ahead. And it's like one of those old cartoons, like the Roadrunner, you know. And they're the coyote. They're going to go over that cliff. And they don't like it when they do. They got no clue. So this man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, let's look at this uh, thing about Jericho. Look at Joshua, Joshua chapter 6. Let's look at the history of Jericho. Now Joshua and the children of Israel left the Moses on the other side of Jordan and Aaron and they both died not going into the promised land. They had done some stuff that displeased God. Um, I don't really believe Moses and Aaron went to hell but uh, they, they sure missed out uh, on getting into the promised land. And so Joshua was the leader at this point. Verse number 1, Joshua chapter 6. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. So news had traveled across Jordan from people that had maybe were from some of these cities that Israel conquered. Uh, you remember they had conquered Og, uh, the giant, the king of Bashan. They had uh, conquered uh, the Ammonites and the Amorites and uh, a whole bunch of other ites on the other side, uh, the land of Gilead. And so uh, God had won these battles by miraculous means at times. And so these people were scared to death because all of a sudden this Two million plus people had come across the river and they didn't have no boats. One day they looked out the window and water was piled miles high down the river and all these people were coming across the river. It's enough to scare the living daylights at anybody. So their plan was, okay, we're going to shut the city up, we're going to lock the, the gates and throw the battlements and Put the, put the guards at the wall and get the weapons ready and, 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 and we don't know what we're going to do but we're going to fight this thing. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thy hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go about the city once. And thou shalt Thus thou shalt do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. And, ye sh and it shall come to pass that when ye uh, make 
a long uh, blast with the ram's horn that when you hear the shout of the trumpet, sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat and the people shall send up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets, trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on, encompass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the Ark of the Lord. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people, that seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed before the Lord and blew with the trumpet and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them and the armed men went before the priest that blew the trumpets and the rearward came after the ark the priest going on and blowing with the trumpets and Joshua had commanded the people saying you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day that I bid you shout, then you shall shout. Boy, how many of you could shut up for a whole week? I mean, I say nothing. That, that, that's the most difficult thing in this whole passage. Especially for someone like me. I think, how in the world would I do that? Uh, so the ark compassed the city going about at once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. Now, maybe they could talk once they got to the camp or something. Probably, probably so. Uh, but when they was marching around that city, not a word, son. Probably creeped the Jericho people out. And, and Joshua rose up in the morning, and the priests took up the Ark of the Covenant, and the seven priests bearing seven trumpets, ram's horns, before the Lord went on continually, and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, and the reward came uh, after the Ark of the Lord, and the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned to the camp. So they did they, so they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout! For the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein. To the Lord only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because they hid the messengers that we sent in. Well, you know the rest of the story. They blew them trumpets and shouted, and that wall just crumbled. I have heard some of the stories stupidest stuff on the internet that there are at least seven or eight videos you can get a hold of made by so-called Christian people that try to explain that this really was no miracle that they weakened the foundations of the wall and they hit some kind of certain note on that seventh day and, and the structure of the wall just failed by itself. No. Uh-uh. I've also seen videos where they dug this place up. This place had walls you could ride chariots on the top of it. No, it just didn't crumble because some people were walking around it seven times on the, you know, seven, eight, whatever it was, 14 times, and some trumpets were blowing. No, 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 no. This was a miracle of God. And Notice what it says in verse 17. And the city shall be cursed. This man, in this story, Jesus is telling, not only is he going the wrong way, but he's headed for something that God didn't like, he cursed it. Now, children, I'm going to give you a piece of advice as a preacher and a fellow Christian. If God says he don't like something, even if it's in the Old Testament, I would think twice about getting involved in it. Now, God took care of the food thing. I'm not talking about food. That's another whole thing. But there's all kinds of things in the Old Testament, like gambling, uh, all kinds of sexual sins, uh, 
uh, being angry all the time and taking it out on people and you know just stuff like that uh, certainly God wouldn't approve of a lot of things that operate even in Pensacola we're a pretty clean town but you don't have to be a rocket scientist as I say to figure this stuff out and this little man in the story evidently he didn't care what God thought about Jeremiah because um, he was going to it and he didn't care. Well, usually when you head for something that God's against, something's going to happen to bad. And that's what happened to this man. Notice where the thieves were. They weren't on the road going up. They were on the road on the side where people were going down. And they were after those people going down. I'm sure, uh, I know there's churches in Las Vegas. But believe me, people do not go to Las Vegas to visit the churches of Las Vegas. Uh -huh. They go to Las Vegas for one reason. To gamble their money away. And to drink and carouse. Because it's the fun town. Well, many people get there, and boy, when they leave there, they sorry they've been there. Real sorry. Some of them lose their whole, I mean, I mean, some of them mortgage their houses and everything else to pay some of this stuff. Because some of these places are run by uh, unsavory people that come, come break your knuckles or or, or some other bad thing they do to you. So, you know, because they want you to pay them because you lost your money at their table or whatever. Uh, that, these people go into that city, they're not thinking about getting right with God. And this guy was going down to Jericho. He wasn't thinking about being right with God or doing anything else. He was going to have him a good time in a good time city. Hallelujah. All right, we'll stop there, and then we're going to look at some more history of Jericho. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, God, that we can uh, study your book. And God, you don't make any secret of this stuff. You tell us exactly what's what. And Lord, uh, there's, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, there's cursed places in the United States. Lord, I really don't know. I do know there's places that, Christians shouldn't ought to go. But because not only is it a bad testimony, but they're going to hurt themselves in the long run. And Lord, help us to stay away from this kind of stuff, Lord. Some of it's very subtle. So please help us, God. I pray you just bless our coming service. And Lord, I pray you get all honor and glory in what's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.